I guess this will have to do. What I'm going to do to show that three of Professor Flanagan's central claims are right, but only in senses that fail to support his larger project. Then I will show, I'll also rebut his argument that naturalism is inconsistent with belief in evolution. So here are the three uh, true claims that he makes. One, contemporary evolutionary theory is compatible with theistic belief. Two, it is no part of current evolutionary theory to say that mutations are random in the sense of implying that they just occur, occur just by chance. Three, naturalism and evolutionary theory together imply the denial of divine design, but evolutionary biology by itself doesn't have that implication. So I think these are all true, but I think they don't do the job that uh, planting I think they do. So I'm going to go through them one at a time. So here we go. With the first one, contemporary evolutionary theory is compatible with theistic belief. Now, Clanton is right about this, given the way he defines his terms. And lurking within his claims is an important point that I myself have often stressed, uh, since I first expressed it in 1990. Suppose we were to send Martian biologists a laying hen, a Pekingese dog, a barn swallow, and a cheetah, and ask them to determine which designs bore the mark of intervention by artificial selectors. <coughs> what could they rely on? And my claim is that it would be very hard, if not impossible, for them to tell. Uh, let's, let's look at a few. Where do we see signs of design? Well, we see a barn swallow that um, lives in a nest in, in a human habitation. We see a, 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 a sort of uh, ridiculous little dog on the <laughs> left. <laughs> we see a beautiful cheetah. It's not so clear how to tell. Uh, or, or look at these two. We have a greyhound, the product of, of artificial selection, and the cheetah, the <coughs> product of natural selection. It's not easy to tell in these cases. What could they rely on? How would they argue, these uh, Martian scientists? They might note that the hen was not did not properly care properly for her eggs. Some varieties of hen have had the instinct for broodiness bred right out of them. It would, so, would have soon become extinct were it not for the environment of artificial incubators that human beings have provided for them. They might note that the Pekingese was pathetically ill-suited for fending for itself in any demanding environment. <laughs> <laughs> the barn swallow's fondness for carpentered nest sites might fool them into the view that it was some sort of pet. And whatever features of the cheetah convinced them that it was a creature of the wild might also be found in greyhounds and have been patiently encouraged by breeders. Artificial environments are themselves a part of nature, after all. Prehistoric fiddling with intergalactic visitors with the DNA of earthly species cannot be ruled out, except on grounds that it is an entirely gratuitous feature. Oh, before I before I pursue that, I want to just show you how how hard it is to tell signs of intelligent design. Which of these is an artifact? <coughs> um, how many say the one on the left? Maybe they're both artifacts. How many the one on the right? Okay. Well, the one on the right is not an artifact at all. It's created by geological processes, just, just freezing and thawing in the in the uh, uh, Arctic. Uh, the one on the left is an Andy Goldworthy sculpture. <coughs> uh, so look at them again. Um, and if you wonder how on earth could those beautiful uh, nests of colored stones uh, be created, uh, you can go to the... Oh, here's another good case. Um, uh, which, are the, which are the uh, uh, designed artifacts in this case? The upper left and the bottom right are both non-designed. They are simply, again, a result of a freezing and thawing in different sorts of Arctic tundra, whereas the rice paddies on the lower left and another Andy Goldworthy uh, sculpture on the right. <laughs> and if you're interested in what the processes look like, you can consult the relevant article in Science that shows how these formed just by natural and unintended and undirected sifting <coughs> of various sorts. It's also true that natural selection is sometimes just very hard to imagine, even by professionals. Um, uh, Alvin uh, 
quoted uh, uh, a wonderful passage from, I guess it was Heckel, wasn't it, the, about the, the, mere, the mere blob of, of the cell. But here's an even better one, I think, from William Bateson, one of the fathers of modern genetics. And, uh, and here's what he had to say not so long ago in 1916. The properties of living things are in some way attached to a material basis, perhaps in some special degree to nuclear chromatin. And yet it is inconceivable that particles of chromatin or any other substance, however complex, can possess those powers which must be assigned to our factors or genes. That's his word for genes. The supposition that particles of chromatin, indistinguishable from each other, and indeed almost homogeneous under any known test, can by their material nature confer all the properties of life, surpasses the range of the most convinced materialism. He just could not imagine DNA. The idea that there might be three billion base pairs in a double helix inside every cell was simply uh, uh, not within the scope of his imagination. I like this example because it nicely illustrates one of my pet themes about philosophers, but it's not just philosophers, uh, who mistake the failure of imagination for an insight into necessity. That is certainly a case, <laughs> a, 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 a point, uh, a case in point here. Um, back to our thesis here. Um, pre, uh, this is continuing the, uh, the quote from my paper some years ago. Prehistoric fiddling by intergalactic visitors with the DNA of earthly species cannot be ruled out except on grounds that it is an entirely gratuitous fantasy. Nothing we have found so far on Earth so much as hints that such a hypothesis is worth further exploration. And note, I hasten to add, lest creationists take heart. Even if we were to discover and translate such a trademark message in our spare DNA, this would do nothing to rescind the claim of the theory of natural selection to explain all design in nature without invocation of a foresighted designer creator outside the system. If the theory of evolution by natural selection can account for the existence of the people at Novagene, that's a company that many years ago uh, put, put its Novagene brand on the DNA products that they made so that they, they signed their, their work. Uh, it was a nice cyber trick. Well, if they can do it now, so our ancestors or our creators from some other galaxy could have done it a long time ago. So, in other words, even if we found, uh, you know, user's manuals uh, <laughs> hidden in the so-called junk DNA of our, of, our, of our genomes, this would not uh, necessarily, it wouldn't show that natural selection was not the answer because it, we could have been hampered with by uh, intergalactic intelligences of an entirely uh, non-supernatural sort uh, many years ago. So I agree with Alvin that contemporary evolutionary theory can't demonstrate the absence of intelligent design. Any biologist who insists that it can is overstating the case. But Alvin must deal with the implications of another sentence from that paper. Except on grounds that it is an entirely gratuitous fantasy. 